Good morning, everyone, and welcome to one of our first webinar sessions of 2022, the ICAS Insights webinar with Chief Economist at the Institute of Directors and for former Labour MP, Kiki Usher. I'm Indy Hoti, ICAS Deputy President and Chair of today's session. So before we start with this morning's webinar, just a few quick bits of housekeeping to get out the way. So today's webinar will be an hour long in total, and we'll be hearing from our wonderful speaker for a total of 45 minutes, which will then be shortly followed by a Q&A segment for around 15 minutes of the webinar. Please feel free throughout the webinar to, to submit any comments or questions at any point throughout, throughout the session, and we'll try and answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A segment. We'll also be recording today's webinar, so we'll be, it will be available for you to watch on demand to share with your friends and colleagues. So that's, that's the housekeeping piece out of the way. I'm very, very delighted to welcome our guest, Kitty. Thank you very much for doing, joining us today. Thank you very much, Indy, and uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to both you and, and ICAS. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here uh, this morning. So I'm going to uh, see if I can uh, get my slides up on the screen there. Here we are. So my, there we go, thank you very much. So the exam question that I'm going to attempt to answer this morning is how can the UK balance the books? And we're talking about uh, the British government uh, after all the spending that's been done in the early stages uh, of the pandemic. And I'm going to divide my presentation into sort of three segments. And if I want you to take away one message from this is that despite all the sort of doom and gloom uh, that we've sort of heard and the sort of fears as to how the government could possibly balance the books, a lot of the decisions on how to do so have already been made. And I'll come to that uh, in the second part of the presentation. But there are a number of risks and assumptions uh, in that, uh, that sort of key message. And so in the final part uh, of the uh, presentation, I'm going to talk a bit about things that might change that might make the calculation perhaps less easy uh, than uh, the Treasury certainly uh, is hoping. And as part of that, there's going to be some very low level audience participation uh, in advance of the Q&A at the end, which I'm very much looking uh, forward to. And uh, if we could just please put the, the poll up uh, on the screen, there is a question I'd like you to consider. You don't have to answer it now, but if you could perhaps uh, choose one of these options uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, we can then come to it when we're looking at the risks section. So the question is, will business leaders invest more or less in their organisations in 2022 compared to 21? Thanks to those that are filling it in. I can see which way the answer is going uh, already. So I think you will have that on your screen 
as time goes on. So uh, when I lose your attention, uh, consider that question or perhaps uh, your thoughts will evolve uh, as the presentation continues. So if that could go, yes, thank you. And then I'll uh, continue my presentation here. So I'm gonna start with the macroeconomic uh, backdrop in the UK because it does uh, determine much of what comes afterwards. And here's the very high level picture uh, in terms of the macro economy. I like to uh, tell stories using stylized graphs, uh, but hopefully they should be uh, okay to interpret. Don't worry too much about uh, the axes. What I really want you to look at is the shape of the graph. And where possible, I've taken them all back to the beginning uh, of January 2007, all those years ago. So you can see how the current situation compares to what uh, I'm sure most of us will remember as the financial crisis. So this is um, GDP. Actual level of prosperity we're creating at any time. So you can see a classic U-shaped uh, recession uh, during the financial crisis, and then the extraordinary sort of shutting down of about a third of the economy in uh, March 2020 during lockdown one. And the question that people have been asking for some time is, is it going to be a U shape, a V shape, a K shape? I think it's more of a kind of deck chair. If you imagine um, your legs going down into the depth of March 2020, and then when uh, uh, lockdowns two and three came into effect, uh, that's perhaps the seat. And then maybe you're stretching upwards into the future. Um, but the question that people have been asking is how long will it take to get back to kind of where we started? And actually, the latest data that we've uh, seen last week shows that our economy returned to its pre-pandemic size in November at the end of last year and is expected uh, to grow into 2022. But we, we don't yet know if Omicron uh, will cause that to perhaps be a little shallower uh, growth than was previously expected. In fact, the official forecast pre-Omicron was of 6% growth in 2022. I think that's a bit optimistic, but the overall story is expected uh, to be quite positive. However, there are some extraordinary things going on in the labour market. Um, and this very complicated graph uh, shows you uh, how vacancies in different parts of the economy uh, compare to what they were at the beginning of the pandemic. So you'll see different sectors of the economy disaggregated out there uh, and all of them rebased back to where February 2020 equals 100. And so the one leaping up at the top is uh, transport, logistics, warehousing. And this is because of the uh, move to online shopping that seems to have persisted. Extraordinary numbers of vacancies there. Within all the cluster, the big fat line is overall uh, for the economy as a whole. And you'll see that has for some months been above its February 2020 level. And even professional services um, uh, are higher than they used to be. And uh, as expected, perhaps the laggards are in travel uh, and uh, tourism and uh, energy. Um, so we've got an economy that's where it was uh, previously, but in terms of the labour market, we've got far more vacancies uh, than we had going into uh, the pandemic. And perhaps because of this, uh, it's looking like the story on unemployment, um, whilst all unemployment isn't much fun for those seeking work who can't find it, isn't nearly as bad uh, as some people thought it, it, it might have been. And that's due in no small part to the success of the furlough scheme. So looking at this graph, the first thing you notice is that the um, effect on unemployment was far worse during the financial crisis than it was during the pandemic, uh, that there was a peak, but actually it was at the beginning, um, and that the Office of Budget Responsibility forecast, which was made as recently as October uh, last year, was expecting another mini peak as people came off furlough, but in fact that has not happened. Um, and uh, the latest data here was out uh, at seven o'clock this morning, and indeed, uh, reassuringly, it showed that unemployment uh, continued to fall along the line of what we were expecting along the dotted lines, uh, the heavy dotted lines on this graph here. 
Why did people not move from furlough to unemployment? Well, actually, it looks as if most people who were in the labour market had moved off furlough in the summer anyway. And those that were still furloughed from their original employment had gone off and got jobs elsewhere. So in a sense, they were being paid twice, which uh, you might have your views on, but in fact, uh, was completely allowed and probably rightly so uh, under, under the rules. What's happened instead is that those who were still on furlough at the end of uh, September when the scheme ended sadly have probably drifted off to inactivity and so they're not showing up in the unemployment forecasts. Turning to inflation, much more worrying. This is data from uh, uh, the Institute of Directors' own sort of in-house survey of members. So this will be business leaders, typically in small and medium-sized uh, firms. We've just got the data here for October and November. Um, and what it's showing is that inflation expectations uh, were rising in the latter part of last year. My gut feeling, and it'd be interesting to know what uh, the audience here thinks as well, is that those ex expectations of inflation have continued to rise, which means there's a risk that there'll be a sort of wage price little spiral if people presume that the cost of living is going up by five, six, maybe seven percent, then perhaps they'll think it's reasonable to pay their staff, particularly in a tight labour market, um, uh, a higher percentage wage settlement than they would otherwise have planned to do, uh, which then means that people can put prices up because people have got money to be able to buy things. And so it uh, perpetuates uh, itself. So I'm a bit worried about inflation. Uh, this is uh, where we got to uh, the dark line is the announced figures. Uh, we should get uh, the latest out later this week. Um, I've put a dotted line of peaking at around 7%, which is way above the, any official forecast at the moment. Um, uh, sticking my neck out a bit there, but uh, I think particularly with the increases in national insurance and energy that we know are coming down uh, the track in, in April, that's not unrealistic. Um, Again, interested to know what your views are. So we've got a decent story on GDP. We've got a very strong story in the labour market and we've got a worrying picture um, in inflation. So I think we should expect turbulence um, in terms of uh, inflation. And that will lead the Bank of England to do a sort of screeching U-turn from their sort of rather calm response uh, so far. So uh, I don't give financial advice, but if you have a way of betting on interest rate rises, I would say now is a very good time uh, to do so. So what does all this mean for the fiscal uh, position? What does this mean in terms of the exam question of uh, how will we balance the books, particularly given the amount of cash that was spent uh, on uh, furlough, which has been successful, uh, but extremely expensive. Well, let's take a little look. I've got a few charts here that use government data, ONS data rather, to um, show what's been going on. They're, they're a little crowded, so I'll, I'll perhaps slow down a little to explain. So this is um, public sector net borrowing, which is the amount of money every month that the Treasury has had to borrow to do what it needs to do. Again, run back to, in fact, a little further, this time to 1997. So you'll see, uh, first of all, occasionally it goes negative. That's a surplus. Um, what That's most often in January when people file, uh, which is the final deadline for filing self-assessment uh, tax returns. So, uh, and is also one of the deadlines for paying uh, self-assessment income tax. So the government is flush in January and the rest of us aren't. Uh, so that's that's where those surpluses are coming from. But you'll see at the beginning of the period, there are surpluses more often. And this is this is Gordon, Gordon Brown's prudence. Um, as a former Labour minister, you might expect me to say that. But there was significant prudence going on uh, in the early years of the Labour government, which then relaxed slightly, but not hugely into uh, the second uh, and third terms uh, of the Labour government. And then you'll see the effect around about 2007-8 of the financial crisis, where corporation tax receipts, particularly in the uh, often lucrative financial service sector, uh, began to um, uh, fade back just at the same time as uh, the, the, the benefits bill, sadly, from that big rise in unemployment that we saw uh, began uh, began to increase. So the sort of what's called the natural stabilizers of the economy began to naturally stabilize uh, in a Keynesian way that meant the government uh, was spending more. And then perhaps a slower sort of retrenchment of that kind of recovery, but the trend line probably does go down until March 2020, uh, when 
there began to be huge intervention uh, in the economy. So perhaps what this graph shows is that is the scale of the monthly outflows compared to recent uh, economic history. Um, again, for good reason, uh, but definitely not insignificant, extremely uh, significant. And if we're trying to work out kind of what what those are, uh, this have a look at this. This categorizes different sort of forms of government expenditure, not in a sort of policy way that we'd perhaps understand, but in a in a government accounting way. And I've put three years on here. I've got the pre-pandemic year as the top bar for each category. Um, and then uh, year one of COVID and then year two uh, of COVID. So, for example, if you look at the first uh, little cluster of bars, um, when interest rates were a little higher in than they are now anyway, or were in uh, the middle of the pandemic, um, you'll see interest payments on government debt as having being at a medium level. Then the Bank of, Eng of England, of course, slashed interest rates at their lowest possible uh, you know, uh, mathematical uh, rate down to 0.1%. So that meant that interest payments on government debt were a little less. Uh, and then that's expected to rise again uh, in this year. Um, so you've got national insurance uh, payments out uh, rising uh, year on year. Uh, you've got social assistance, it's called in this category, that's a sort of DWP uh, benefit type payments, um, some of which, of course, were uh, discretionary because of the pandemic, uh, rising a lot in year one of the pandemic, only falling back uh, slightly. And then the big one is what's called here goods and services. It's basically government departmental spending. So driven here by increases uh, to the NHS, uh, big rise in year one of COVID and expected uh, to tick up a bit uh, this year as well. Pay settlements also rising. Local government got a huge uh, amount of money to uh, be able to support local businesses and also other discretionary emergency spending as it saw fit, only partially uh, reversed. Uh, this year. And then at the bottom, you've only got two bars because uh, the um, items that are being picked out simply didn't exist prior to the pandemic. You've got the furlough scheme, that's CJRS, you've got uh, subsidies um, uh, and other bits and pieces that aren't categorised that don't show a strong trend. Um, so big spending for reasons that we understand um, uh, and for understandable uh, reasons uh, too. Uh, so, uh, but the question comes back to uh, what does all this mean? It's only partially going to be uh, reversed through policy. Now, here's the here's the one that I think is worth internalising. Um, this is government debt as a proportion of the size of the economy. The previous two slides. We're talking about um, outpayments, um, so, so the sort of uh, actual outflows of cash, how much are we spending? This looks at the kind of flows of debt on a, on, on a monthly and annual basis. What this slide does is looks at the stock of outstanding debt. So um, to take a very sort of crude analogy, this is not how much you're paying on your mortgage every month. It's the outstanding balance on your mortgage. So the first thing, and I've gone back 100 years here. So the first thing that's sort of instantly visible is that it is now at the highest level in peacetime. Uh, but it was much, much higher as a result of the spending that took place during World War II. And we did recover from that uh, in the rest of the 20th century. So we've we've done it before and we can do it again. This, uh, the next thing to notice is um, the, the relative effect of the financial crisis and the pandemic. So you can see I've just marked in 2007-8 um, how uh, the stock of government debt rose quite substantially during the financial crisis. And it rose again in the pandemic, but um, uh, not further, you know, the, the the rate wasn't as much as the sort of medium term effect from that uh, U-shaped classic uh, economic uh, recession. So, but it is still pretty high. Um, it's going to peak at around 100% of GDP. That 100% is not particularly meaningful. It just means that the size of the debt is the same as uh, the amount uh, of wealth that, that we produce every year. It feels like a big number. Um, for contrast, those of you who are as old as I am and can remember the policy debates of the Maastricht criteria for joining the euro. Remember that? Um, 
I think at the time to join the euro, uh, countries had to have their debt. Uh, was it falling to 60% of GDP or was it 40? Maybe Gordon Brown's golden rule was 40. And to join the euro, it had to be falling to 60. And so now we're rising to 100. So in terms of recent, recent economic history, uh, this certainly feels high. So what I want to turn to now is those little dotted lines of the forecast. This is not my forecast. This is the Office of Budget Responsibility forecast, and it's their job to forecast this. That's what they're kind of uh, they're in law to do. So the key question is, why are they forecasting it uh, to fall? Just to get a sense of the magnitude, this is £315 billion of extra pandemic spending, mainly public services and furlough but also to business as well. So why is that already projected to fall? Well, the reason is that in the budget a year ago, in March 2021, the government made two crucial decisions that were, were of themselves sufficient to make that line start curving downwards, a major one and a minor one. The minor one was to freeze in cash terms the income tax thresholds. So if you're on the higher rate, for example, uh, the point at which that kicks in is not uprated with inflation. So that will automatically take more people in as wages just go up by a few percent uh, every year. And then the big one is a decision in 2021 to raise corporation tax, the main rate of corporation tax from 19% to 25% um, this time next year, so in April 2023. So they pre-announced by two years a future rise in corporation tax. And that was the main factor that enabled the official forecasting agency to forecast uh, debt to come down along, uh, along with other assumptions they made about the recovery uh, of the economy. So this is hugely significant. It's hugely significant uh, because it hasn't happened yet, but the sort of it's already been decided, it's already been baked in. And it means that the probably, <laughs> famous last words, the probably won't be another massive tax increase if nothing else changes in order to pay for the pandemic. Now, it won't totally pay for the pandemic, but what it will do is put uh, the path of government debt on a downward path. And that fundamentally is what really matters, because then as time goes on, that will automatically mean that debt will continue to fall. We're kind of paying off more than we're um, accumulating. And it's also crucially what the financial markets need. The word sustainability is the key uh, word for how sort of sovereign debt markets view um, uh, government debt. And by having something that's on a downward path, they think this is not going to accelerate. This is not Greece in 2012. The UK government has a plan to put this on a downward path. So the answer to the question is uh, how we're going to pay for it. Well, mainly through future corporation tax uh, rises. So we may not like this as businesses. And then, of course, uh, it's not helped by the fact that then in the autumn of last year, there was a further decision that wasn't even made at a budget to raise national insurance. Um, but that has been earmarked for the NHS. So in a sense, that's what allows the spending on the NHS not to be slashed back to what it was um, previously. Uh, so uh, it will have an impact and it has already been legislated for. But uh, this calculation was made prior uh, to the national insurance uh, decision. And it is this corporation tax rise that starts to bring uh, the debt down. OK, so now turning to the risks. So if all that happens, um, as the government uh, expects, then, you know, this essay question is uh, a relatively short essay and uh, we might not like what's happened, but fundamentally we'll be pleased the economy is recovering uh, and uh, as long as there's no other massive shock, eventually uh, the books will, if not to be balanced, because that's unusual, will at least be a little nearer uh, to balance. So there are very various risks to that. Um, and this is your warning. If you haven't filled in uh, the poll, uh, please do so, because I'm going to ask for the answers in a couple of slides time. So um, I'm going to present a sort of 
some few bits and pieces and just kind of talk around what, what the risks are. I think there are two main uh, risks uh, that might lead the government uh, to have to maybe take some other fiscal decisions that it very much uh, doesn't want to make. The first is whether they will have to uh, significantly budget differently, if that's a <laughs> vague way of describing it, uh, uh, add, you know, uh, account for the, the risk that interest rates are going to rise uh, much faster. And of course, what will drive up interest rates is inflation rising much faster uh, than they had initially anticipated. So interest rate risk uh, is a key uh, problem for the government, because as we saw earlier on, it's a big determinant uh, of spending and very, very sensitive um, uh, to interest rates because of this massive stock uh, of government debt. So that's that's the first risk, uh, perhaps. The second is that, and I'll probably come to that first, um, is that uh, the economy will not recover in 2022 in the way that people are expecting. And in some ways, there are lots of reasons to think that it that it won't, because if you think of the economy as the sort of uh, aggregate of all the spending that's taking place, well, we've got the biggest player government wanting to retrench spending. We've got difficulties in our export markets um, as our biggest market in the e in the EU decides it's quite difficult to buy from Britain at the moment, and we haven't reorientated our trade elsewhere. Consumers are feeling pretty positive, so maybe that's a plus point. But all of the forecasts rely hugely on a massive increase in business investment this year compared to last year. I think the official forecast is it should rise 16%. And I'm just going to delve into that a little bit now. We asked our members um, uh, what their plans were uh, for growth at the moment. And we did get a pretty positive answer, which is great. Love working with entrepreneurs. Um, good entrepreneurs always have a plan. So you'll see the vast majority say they have plans for steady growth. Uh, an important minority says they're feeling very ambitious. Um, roughly the same amount say that they're happy um, at their current operation of business and only a small proportion say that they're consolidating or cutting costs in a difficult uh, environment. Uh, so that looks, looks pretty good. That was done in October um, when the mood wasn't as high as it had been in the early summer, but was still uh, pretty positive. Since then, economic confidence has taken a tumble. This is a back series uh, up to and including December this year of the Institute of Directors Economic Confidence Index, which is our members' views on the um, uh, how optimistic they are about the sort of business operating environment. So not their own firm, but how they see the economy as a whole. Um, and you'll see it was at its highest uh, ever, both just before the pandemic, tragically, um, and also in the early summer. And then with the national insurance increases and the supply side shortages coming to the fore in the early autumn, it sort of fell back to neutral and then fell quite substantially again uh, in December. Why does this matter? Well, um, investment intentions are crucially linked uh, to how small and medium sized firms uh, uh, perceived uh, to be the risks of the macro economy. People feel they can't control the um, business operating environment, and so they're hesitant of putting their own um, uh, retained profits or shareholders uh, cash or take on debt to invest if they think the world is uncertain. So we find a strong correlation between this series uh, and investment uh, intentions. And in fact, we do a separate tracker question that asks about uh, investment intentions. Um, and for those who said they weren't planning to increase investment next year, we gave them a list of things that might be persuaded to make them change their mind. And this included, you know, massively generous tax breaks um, and other things that business advocacy groups are rightly uh, often asking for. But we asked this question, you said you plan to keep the level of investment the same or reduce it in the next 12 months. Would any of the following cause you to decide to increase it instead? And the winner of that uh, was quite interesting, wasn't quite what I expected. Um, the winner it was quite widespread, this is 36% is the winner, um, was stronger growth prospects for the UK economy. 
So there we have it. If we think that the prospects of growth for the UK economy are weak, then we are less likely uh, to invest as business leaders. So we've got ourselves a catch-22 situation because, of course, it's that investment that's needed uh, to produce the economic growth in uh, the first place. So I'm now going to turn to the crowd and um, I, you've probably seen the poll, but uh, on my view, I don't see it. Ah, oh, great. It's going to be all right. So we've got three quarters of you are saying that uh, business leaders will invest more in their organisations in 2022 compared to 2021. Nearly one in five, not sure. One in 10 saying uh, invest less. Well, that's that's extremely uh, good news because we need that investment up. And in a sense, it it's common sense because uh, the first four months of 2021 still felt pretty much like like crisis, whereas now, um, whilst Omicron was difficult and caused a wobble, uh, we we do I think probably feel that we may be closer towards uh, the end game. So if I can go back to uh, my slides, thank you very much to everyone who participated uh, in that poll. Um, another sense of what the risk to that uh, investment might be when we ask uh, our members if they could wave a wand and choose to improve one thing about the business operating environment, what would it be? And um, we get trading relationship uh, with the EU. So a large proportion, perhaps 60% uh, of our members are importers or exporters, some of them quite occasionally so. Um, and we've got uh, uh, in increasing import controls and just more uncertainty and difficulty associated with our trading relationship with the EU that's causing real trouble. Um, and then skills shortages, as we saw from the vacancies, um, that's becoming a, a real issue. And not just for transportation, but actually widespread across the, across the economy as both um, employers and individuals are deciding uh, what the medium term holds in store for them and taking advantage of opportunities as they come. And then third, uh, as you'd expect from the uh, previous uh, bit of data about investment intentions, uh, UK economic conditions uh, is, is also uh, in a strong third place as to one thing that people want to improve about their business environment. Um, so all of this are risks uh, to future growth. Interestingly, the kind of usual wish list of uh, trade bodies in terms of tax and regulation is a little cluster that is um, second uh, to these skill shortages, uh, EU and overall economic uh, conditions. Um, and sort of finally on this, we asked people to, to rank uh, which, slightly different question, which factors are having a negative impact on their organisation. And we get a similar result, coronavirus, obviously, um, but that's actually falling, as you'd expect, uh, UK economy and skills shortages, then trade. And then within tax and regulation, concerns about employment tax rising very fast, Within infrastructure, concerns about energy cost rising fast, but cash flow for most so still seems to be strong. And I'm conscious I'm speaking to ICAS, so I'd very much like to hear views if you don't feel that that uh, is actually uh, the case. Um, and one sort of to segue into the next risk of higher interest rates and inflation, um, We've been trying to explore what the economic impact of higher national insurance contributions is going to be, and looking at this from the employer side, uh, not the employee side. And what, one thing that seems to be coming out is that they in themselves will be inflationary. Um, so uh, higher national insurance contributions for employers are just basically an increase in costs because they're unlike corporation tax and not linked uh, to, to profits. And so the question is, to what extent can that be passed on through higher prices? Uh, and we do find that coming out, um, coming out quite strongly uh, through our data. So what I'd like to sort of turn to the conversation um, with you uh, now, uh, Indy, is uh, does does the sort of macro view and the data that I've presented here fit with uh, the experience of those uh, who are either running their own businesses or uh, working with clients uh, who are trying to make sense uh, all, of all of this? Um, are higher costs being passed through or absorbed? If they're being passed through uh, to higher prices, uh, then that means that we do have a really serious problem uh, with inflation 
um, uh, rather than this sort of idea of transitory inflation, because higher costs will become higher prices, which will become higher costs, which will become higher prices. Um, and that is the central banker's nightmare. So is that happening or is it happening to an extent and also being absorbed, uh, in which case, you know, perhaps it, that might be a more muted uh, effect. Uh, but most importantly, you know, what are the plans and assumptions uh, for 2022? Um, are they for continued growth, which is great because that will be probably self-fulfilling? Or is there a sense that we need to retrench slightly? I suspect the answer to that is um, uh, medium term planning. What I'm sort of sensing, and you can see it uh, in the high activity in the M&A sector with very high volume uh, of deals, uh, is that firms are beginning to work out what their longer term future is uh, and taking uh, advantages uh, of some weaker players in order to um, orient themselves toward those, towards those goals. So, um, Indy, that's the end of my prepared remarks, but uh, obviously very happy to answer any questions that people may have. Great. Thank you so much, Kitty. A very, very insightful talk there. Some lot, lot, lot to take in and digest. Um, some a good shopping list of questions as well. Uh, we've, got, we've got lots of questions coming in from some of our members. Have uh, anyone got any thoughts uh, or comments in relation to some of the questions that uh, Kitty's posed at the end? Then please do feel for it. Feel free, sorry, to share your thoughts in the discussion box. Um, but I'll, I'll kick off with some of the questions that we've got through already. And an interesting piece um, that's been mentioned is around employment and the labour market. And we're hearing lots of talk around sort of, you know, the great resignation of the last, you know, the last 12 months, there being a sort of war on talent. Uh, there's a very interesting piece that you mentioned there around inact inactivity rates. And I understand that there were some re recent um, unemployment labour market figures that had come out early part of this year. So very keen just to get your thoughts on the landscape uh, uh, in, in terms of the labour market. Yes, it's, it's quite extraordinary what's happening in the labour market. Um, and I think with the pandemic as a whole, uh, what uh, economists and in fact, business leaders as well are trying to work out is you know what which of the changes that we've seen are permanent which of them is a new normal and which will just revert back to type and in the labor market i'm increasingly coming to the view um that there is a structural change that's taking place and it's not just about the place of work as office workers are, are working more, more more flexibly and um we saw that in um office of national statistics data that came out actually at seven o'clock this morning and it is around this rise in inactivity so in the first phase of the pandemic we saw a a rise in inactivity in particular uh, amongst younger workers and when i say inactivity it's people who say they're not available for work and this was completely rational and it was mainly younger people deciding that they would um, continue their education perhaps more than they previously thought they might do because they didn't fancy starting their careers in the middle of a global pandemic and, and that makes total sense and, and that has since reversed. We saw another trend early on which is that uh, the number of people who said that they were inactive because, and there's an option they can tick in the surveys here, they were lo looking after family or home the number of people who tick that box fell hugely. And so I'm actually quite encouraged by this because it does perhaps imply that those that are juggling were juggling so much that they felt they couldn't uh, work previously might have been helped by the shift to working from home. And maybe that will continue, which will be uh, good news uh, for the households affected. So those are the two early things. But then in recent months, we've seen a rise in inactivity um, amongst older workers, so people choosing to effectively not be available for work. And in particular, those aged between 50 and 64, so still of working age, but the older cohort. And um, what's slightly heartbreaking is that the a kind of typical reason would be um, them self-identifying as being long-term sick. So this is, this is quite disturbing, both on a sort of human level and also for the economy. Um, now, whether that's long COVID, or whether it's the kind of debilitating effect of having been out of the labour market for some time if these people were on furlough um, is not clear. And I think there needs to be research into that. Separately, there's another box you can tick that is just other. Um, so not studying, not looking after family in a home, uh, not long term sick. Um, 
and uh, that's gone up a little, but not not by so much as um, the sickness trend. So I'm presuming in the other category are people who've just decided that um, for lifestyle reasons um, they no longer want to want to be working, and perhaps they have more money than they thought they had, um, and so that's a viable option for them. So there's a prob probably a bit of that going on in in the labour market as well. But what's becoming increasingly clear is there's a kind of scar. Effect, economic scarring effect um, from from older inactive work, workers, and it could be for um, rather disturbing reasons. Now, thanks for your insights there, Kitty. And I think there's it's a very interesting period of time that we're currently in because there's a strong human element to some of these statistics that is underlying this, which um, you wouldn't not, you, you know there's always that element, but it's much more pronounced, and you're seeing diff different demographics that are experiencing slightly different different challenges. Um, slightly tangential. But sim uh, in similar vein, and we've got one question coming from John, and that's around sort of one key goal in balancing the books is is around increasing productivity, right? And uh, the UK has historically been poor at this in recent years. Um, increased capital investment can help, but what else can we do um, to help increase productivity? Uh, that's a that's a really good question. So, uh, as I'm sure many people will know. Uh, we have historically lagged behind uh, the US, uh, France and Germany in productivity, regardless of kind of how you measure it. So that's out, normally output per worker, but could be output per hour. We were narrowing that slightly, uh, at least with France and Germany. And then something happened after the financial crisis um, that meant that those gains weren't continued. Um, my personal view is that actually we've got some mathematics going on here that because um, employment uh, has outperformed since the financial crisis in the in, in that decade between the financial crisis and uh, and the pandemic more and more people were entering uh, the labor market and so mathematically particularly if those jobs are you know perhaps not perhaps slightly less well paid than the average so slight but you know, just mathematically, they only have to be slightly under the average for that to look as if productivity is falling, whereas in fact wealth is okay and households aren't doing that badly. So the, the big question is whether the dislocation that we've had from the pandemic is going to um, get us on a new path in terms of productivity. So mathematically, um, it might if we've got more inactivity. So if productivity is output per worker and we've got less workers, then it's going to look like we've got more productivity. And certainly it looked like that to start with because it was the lower skilled jobs in retail and hospitality typically done by younger workers um, that, that weren't sort of in action. And so measured productivity kind of soared, but that's now falling back as all that uh, normalises. But the big question is whether something's changed in the medium term. I mean, there are various you know, economic, uh, uh, academic arguments as to what drives up productivity. I think the things to look at um, are the long-term impact of remote working, which seems to be no real conclusions one way or the other uh, in terms of productivity, um, but it may prove useful getting more people into the labour market who have caring responsibilities at home, as I said. But the, and then there's the digital adoption piece, which is potentially very positive. So there is an established um, academic link between uh, using modern software and your productivity performance. So there's been much talk of the long tail of underperforming British productivity and people tend to think of, you know, perhaps slightly sluggish, small and medium sized companies that aren't adopting the latest technology all the time in the way that fast growing or larger companies do. Um, but of course, everyone's had to adopt digital technology and, um, <laughs> uh, and are pro probably more likely to be using sort of enterprise resource management tools and, you know, filing their accounts electronically um, in a way that they, they sort of hadn't got around to doing uh prior to the uh, pandemic so that's that's pretty positive positive. and the other thing that i think is quite positive uh and this is a very controversial theory um that the treasury likes and purist economists like it's called creative destruction um which is bad in human forms because uh, in human impacts it's got the word uh, destruction in it but in economic terms over the medium term it can be quite exciting so what the idea here is that if you have a shock a negative shock to the economy that um, those firms that were just struggling um, and keeping their head just above water uh, might sadly go under 
uh, which would be bad news in the short term for those affected and bad news for the owners of those firms. But as those people who are employed go and get new work as everything sorts itself out they might actually be employed in more successful companies and so on average you get rises in productivity and i think i referred to the sort of big churn in merger and acquisition activity lots of sort of forward planning going on at the moment and i think we may start to see uh, some quite exciting productivity increases from a simply a more efficiently organized economy once we're kind of through the hump of the churn and the change Definitely resonate with some of those thoughts there, Kitty. Um, my personal experience is uh, uh, running a digital consultancy, the number of clients embarking on sort of digital transformation projects due to external factors because of COVID and remote working was huge. And um, hopefully that will give rise to um, significant productivity increases in the, in the long term. Um, moving on slightly, and, and one piece that you mentioned there around sort of headline growth, actually. So it's very, very promising that you know GDP growth uh, for, forecast is, is very positive for the, for the UK economy specifically. But actually, if you peel back the layers, there's an interesting regional story for the UK as well there, right? Um, with certain regions of the UK, specifically the North and the Midlands, um, outperforming the South um, in terms of forecast. So what are your thoughts um, and insights in, in relation to that? Yes, it, the pandemic in terms of the sort of spatial regional picture is really a story of London versus the rest. Um, so London has been disproportionately hit. Now you might say they're more able to cope and that's 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 fine. Um, but the, the structure of the economy uh, meant that they had far less footfall because they had more office workers. Um, and so and that plus um, people uh, being on a sort of those office workers being on a sort of quest for space has both uh, reduced disproportionately the kind of hospitality and retail sector um, and footfall in central London and also meant that uh, house prices haven't seen the rapid gains that other parts of the country uh, have seen. Um, and at the same time, we've got this uh, another sort of potentially interesting and impactful phenomenon of um, remote working might mean that uh, spending power is distributed more uh, more widely throughout the economy. Now, you can go pretty, mu pretty much anywhere outside London, and the last thing they want is Londoners moving in and uh, second homes being purchased. Um, but there may be an economic effect if, if, if that means that London salaries are, in effect, being, being spent uh, elsewhere. Um, I think it's too early to say whether the government's levelling up uh, policies uh, have uh, produced much tangible yet. We're eagerly waiting their white paper uh, in this regard. So I think the answer to your question is that the pandemic had more of a dampening effect in London than elsewhere. So we're seeing growth rates that are that are faster elsewhere. Thanks for your insights there, Kitty. We've got, we've got lots of questions coming in, so we'll try and cover off as many of them as we can. Um, there's one more here that's come in from Stephen. I think uh, ultimately the question here is around, is there a risk that we're looking at government debt like household debt, and partly because of historically the, hist the austerity agenda sort of pushed that comparison, when in actual fact it's, 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 it's managed very, very differently? So is there a risk that we're making a very simple comparison here? Yeah, I'm conscious that I did uh, use that comparison in order to try and describe the difference between flow of debt and stock. Um, it's because it can be quite complicated to get your head around if you're not, um, uh, if you haven't sort of thought about it before. Um, but of course, they're completely different. Uh, the, the main reason being that uh, the government is pretty much able to borrow at will, certainly this this government, whereas uh, I'm not sure my bank would lend to me <laughs> at will. Um, but the, uh, and also it's the sort of path rather than the, um, actually maybe that is similar. What, what is similar about the two is that there needs to be a plan to repay. So where that, where that manifests itself in the sovereign debt market, in the sovereign bond markets, is as I described, that the, that the, the, the dotted line needs to point downwards. Um, and I don't want to stretch this too far, but I guess um, when you're seeking to borrow money as a household for whatever reason, then it, it needs to you know, be demonstrably able to pay it back. So in that sense, it can be a useful uh, analogy, but uh, there's far more liquidity, certainly for the UK government uh, than, than there is my household. Not sure that answers your question. 
No, no, thanks, thanks for your insights, Zeki. I think it's just you know one way to try to you know communicate this, especially when you're looking at the broader uh, communicating to the broader public. But there's always a risk here when you're oversimplifying anything. Um, again, another question that's come in from Alexander. Do you, and and then this goes back to now the piece around uh, corporation tax. Um, so, do you think a rise in corporation tax as planned um, will be successful? Um, you know, what I think his understanding is that only the top 30% of companies will be in scope for it, this increase. Um, so what are your thoughts on that in terms of the success of relying on rate, relying on uh, increasing corporation tax rate? I think it will be successful um, in that it will do what it's forecast to do because the incidence of who pays it is kind of embedded into that. I think there's a question about whether it becomes politically untenable. I think businesses are, are, however, more irritated by the rise in national insurance um, than the corporation tax rise. But of course, that comes in a year earlier. So it's almost asked the question this time next year. Corporation tax, I mean, nobody likes taxes. You know, you know I work for a business organisation, but they don't want taxes to rise. Um, but they were seen as historically well, not so much historically, but well, yeah, historically, if you take a long term, but also internationally, um, comparatively low. So it's almost like it's come back into the middle of, of the pack. Um, and it is fundamentally uh, a rise in tax on profits rather than a flat, uh, a flat cost. So I suppose the main risks are whether the economy doesn't do um, what uh, it was thought it would do, because it, um, corporation tax receipts are very closely correlated uh, to what's going on in the economy, obviously, because there are a tax on profits. Um, and since that decision was made, uh, the economy's come back better in this year. Sorry, when I say this year, in the last year, in 2021, um, than was expected in, in March. So if anything, it'll bring in more. In fact, it has brought in more over the course of 2021. Corporation tax has than was expected, even before the rise. Um, so then you have to look as to whether the growth forecasts of 2022 are realistic. Uh, the official growth, fast, growth forecast is 6%, which is still, you know, very strong. Um, I think that might be a little over-optimistic, over um, but even 3 or 4%, given that we're a bit stronger than we thought last year, doesn't take us far off what that forecast on that uh, little dotted line curving slightly downwards um, would have brought us. Um, so I think probably the only risk is if there's a great big political campaign against it. And that I'm not seeing that at the moment. Just grumbling is what I'm seeing at the moment. Yeah, no, thanks for your for your insights there, Kitty. I'll move very swiftly to lots of questions here. Um, this is really interesting around, one around sort of balancing the books and the sustainability and ESG agenda. So the green transition promises lots of investment and new jobs in the longer term, which is all positive for balancing the books. However, in the shorter term, we have the risk of increased pressures on household budgets, such as with gas prices and utility costs, etc. So how do we avoid the short term pressures and knocking the economy off course, both to net zero and to balancing the books? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, in terms of balancing the books, the government has put some budget towards funding demonstration projects to try and keep, you know, kickstart the technology um, in this area, but that's already sort of baked in. Um, I think uh, and the rise in energy bills in the next few months um, isn't being driven by um, ESG, it's being driven by the rising global cost of energy, um, but of course the two are linked. Um, I think in the short term, what I was asked in an interview the other day, what keeps you awake at night? I'm not being kept awake at night by much in economic terms, but what would cause me to worry is if consumers begin to think that the future is not getting better. Um, so at the moment, this is fundamentally an economy that wants to recover and Certainly a large proportion of households have got savings that they didn't plan to make as a result of the pandemic. And so the only thing that's stopping people spending uh, is restrictions. <laughs> um, now, if other things began to stop people spending, like fear of rising uh, cost of living, which, which energy is a huge part, so that they begin to think they need to start to retrench and save more, um, that in itself will cause uh, an economic problem that's what really caused the problem uh, for the financial crisis it wasn't 
issues at Northern Rock. It was the entire country saying, oh, goodness, I've got too much on my credit card. I need to start saving. Um, and that in itself caused caused the recession. So I think the causality is slightly different and energy is part of the mix uh, in the shorter term. Uh, in the longer term, certainly what our members think is, you know, they're perfectly willing to play their part to contribute towards net zero, but they need to know how to do it. They need more leadership in government as to what they, as a smaller business, what they tangibly need to do to make sure that they've covered that off. I think that continues to be a key theme in the ESG and sustainability, sustainability space. Um, another very interesting question that's come in from Chris, and this is around the UK situation in comparison to some of our Eurozone counterparts. So in terms of the UK situation at the moment, in terms of balancing the books, how do we compare at a macro level to some of our Eurozone counterparts in sort of Germany, France, Spain or, or Netherlands? Yes, great question. It's not dissimilar. Um, the differences are in the underlying trends. So uh, Germany has had a more positive sort of underlying unemployment story in the last 15 years and France less so. Um, but both had a, uh, that initial rise in unemployment, um, but then falling back again. And both had implemented some variant uh, of a furlough scheme. Um, inflation is a problem globally. I don't know if that's reassuring or not. <laughs> Probably not, because it means we all have to get it together to um, tackle it uh, together. So the real difference actually is with the US, where they didn't have a furlough scheme. And so um, they got a massive, massive spike in unemployment, uh, politically panicked and sent, literally sent checks to every household. So people then got re-employed as those checks got spent. Um, but as a result, perhaps of that, they're kind of leading the pack in terms of um, inflation pressure. Um, and their latest results are up at seven, whereas are currently at 5%. Um, so I would say a very broad, broadly similar picture. Um, China is very different, it has had a very different profile um, from the pandemic, um, far less economic impact, but they were in a situation where their economy was was gently slowing anyway. And th thank you, Kitty, there for your insights again. Um, I think we've got time just for one more question, um, a very, very, very quick one, a very interesting one. Um, and th that, this is around sort of the impact of the pandemic and options for SMEs uh, around how they've been hit, hit by the pandemic over the last three years and what advice or options have you or the IOD given to them in terms of tackling some of these challenges we've discussed? Yes, and obviously it's different in different sectors of the economy. Our, our role in the IOD has been to ensure that um, those sectors that you might think have been sort of unfairly affected or you know, particularly unfortunately affected um, in leisure and hospitality have had uh, sufficient resources uh, available to them from, from government. Uh, and there was a big sort of lobbying exercise uh, just before Christmas that did um, lead to a bit more support uh, becoming available. Uh, obviously, we're very much in favour of the furlough and the self-employment schemes um, when they were introduced, which are hugely helpful to, to our members. Um, I mean, fundamentally, the private sector is the private sector. I think I sort of reflect in terms of what to do now, I sort of reflect back to our, our members that some sort of deeper thinking, I think, is taking place um, across the economy. And what I find members are particularly interested in is, is how everyone else is thinking. So that's why we publish our confidence index to, to show that, that there is quite a strong connection between what's perceived to be happening in the news and how confident business leaders in, in, in smaller um, companies uh, are feeling. Uh, so you might presume that's what your competitors are feeling. And perhaps I'll finish off, Indy, on an anecdote that's probably the single moment in terms of business response that has stuck in my brain. I was doing a session like this early in the pandemic, perhaps around um, April, May 2020. And so, uh, and I got a, a question just in a similar way from a business owner who said very simply, what should we do now? And I was astonished by the question. And uh, my answer then is probably the same as it would be now, which is, work out what your customers want, work out how to give it to them, work out how you can fulfill the orders, work out how you need to pivot. It's kind of blindingly obvious without wanting to, it's sort of easy for me to preach that. Um, but business is business and the, the, the world keeps changing. 
Um, and you know, those who are happy to keep changing and sniff out the opportunities are the ones that do particularly well when there is change. Uh, thank you for that anecdote, Kitty. Like I said, going right back to the basics and focusing right back to the in terms of how to serve them. Um, thank you so much for the time this morning. It's been an absolutely fascinating session. Um, we really, really appreciate you sharing your insights today with us. Um, I hope that you've all enjoyed today's event and perhaps given you something new to think about or take away. Um, I just want to thank you, thank everyone for joining today. And again, a massive thank you for Kitty for giving us um, her insights. Our next event will be taking place on Thursday, the 20th of January at 11 a.m. as part of the Ask ICAST series on managing COVID-19 and insights from CAs in the public sector. So you can sign up via ICAST.com forward slash events. I do hope that all of you enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for joining our ICAST Insights event this morning.